Uh, for starters, Bird, uh, thank you for having me out, man. This is a freaking honor. Um, I'll never forget when you and Phil came out four and a half years ago and helped deliver our equipment and set things up. Uh, Phil, when I first met you back then, man, ever since then, the Sorenex team, Kevin, Phil, anything I've ever needed, Matt, you guys always return our emails, answer questions, Dobby, Austin, Darren, Dre, I mean, uh, Anita, I probably, I don't know if she's even, I don't even know who she is, but I've emailed her about a hundred times. But uh, thank you, wherever you are, Anita. But um, when Bert asked me to do this, I was like, where do, what do I bring to the table? What can I talk about that uh, hopefully can help others? I've been on this kick lately of exploring the corners. Um, I think it's more of uh, me trying to find out who I am as a person. Uh, I think I went through a couple years of not very certain about who I am, being influenced by others, and uh, it kind of helped guide me to where I am today. So exploring the corners is not just exercise prescription or variety or variability or whatever we want to call it, but it's a, it's a mindset. So we... So when we think about movement, this is probably something if you use social media, maybe you've seen exercises that I've posted. But I always want to stop because coaches always ask me, what goes into this? Or how should I program this? Or where should I put this? And I think that's putting the cart before the horse because this is a snippet of a couple reps within a couple sets, within one workout, within a training program, uh, within a relationship between me and this kid. So it's, how do we get to this point, which is where I'm at? Uh, if you've seen World War Z, uh, Brad Pitt has a quote that he says, uh, movement is life. That's nothing organic or anything, but uh, if movement is life, then um, what's the life cycle of movement? So that's kind of what I'm going to hint at and where we get to there. But at first... This thing is not working. Understand that movement is not just a physical thing. It's a spiritual, emotional. Anyone can move weight. Anyone can be strong, but not everyone can move people. My wife's one of the strongest people I've ever met. And she, I mean, she's pretty strong, kind of, I guess, but she's pretty weak. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to start this out with a quote from the best movie you've ever seen, uh, Interstellar. And it's, uh, we've forgotten who we are, explorers and pioneers, not caretakers. I think this is something that we commonly do is we're so comfortable with where we're at that we're just okay. We're okay with where we're at, the status quo, and we should constantly be pushing the edges. Look around this room. They're obviously not caretakers. They're obviously not comfortable of where they're at. So when it comes to exploring, man, this is going to be a pain. I think uh, the top thing nowadays is what's your top favorite book? Uh, what's, your, what's the best book you've read? What's your top five list? And it's always a leadership book. It's always some sort of relationship book or some sort of military book. As professionals, the first book should be a netter. If you don't understand the black and white, then in my opinion, you have no, no reason to be exploring the gray areas. And I got a real corny joke, but it's uh, what's black and white and gray all over, it's strength and conditioning. When it comes to education, I, I think of it as we start with the basics, you know, the netter, and then as you get more into it, you start looking into, especially with my staff that I'm with, we're looking at, you know, fascial slings and anatomy trains and trying to push the limits on what we know. But if you always have a solid background of education, you'll always have something to fall back on. Nothing, to me, makes me more confident than somewhat understanding what I currently know. Um, I give the analogy of a backstop with softball. If you've ever been to a Little League softball game or a baseball game, there's nothing worse than a huge backstop. 
you know you're in for a long game. And I think education gives us a short backstop. It gives us, if the ball gets past us every now and then, we can get back to the ball. It helps us prepare for unprepared situations. And you can plan a pretty picnic, but you can't predict the weather. Uh, education's important. Educating is important, -er, uh, or something like that. But um, when you understand something, teaching it to others, that's the fastest way to understand things. I often teach my kids things that they should not know about but it helps me articulate things to a 12-year-old or a 6-year-old, and they just kind of look at me like I'm Charlie Brown, but it helps me get my point across. If I can get a point across to a kid, I can get that point across to an adult. When you teach something to someone, it's very powerful. When you understand something, you understand a concept, no one can take that from you, and there's something powerful about that, especially kind of where I grew up. There's a lot of things that can get taken from you. You can get your pride taken from you, Money, house, parents. But when you know something, someone can't take that from you. My number one goal with people that I work with is to educate them on their bodies. Um, this comes from one of my kids. It's one of my favorite pictures. He sent me a picture of him on the beach with this girl he liked. And uh, it was a picture of her body. And then it was kind of zoomed in. And then it was zoomed in. And then it was zoomed in again. And he said, Coach, I can't be with this girl. Look at those legs. I was like, when? Learning. Nothing is, learning is nothing novel. Animals can learn. You can teach a bird how to do tricks or a dolphin or, you know, machines can learn. Even thermostats can learn. The brilliance with humans is we can understand. And that's where the creativity lies is being able to combine or connect the dots this is going to be, between academia and practicality. Because what we want to happen, what we know works, is that doesn't always work that way. If I had a line like this, and I said, the fastest way from, a straight, or from point A to point B is a straight line, no one would blink an eye. It's very relative, we've all seen it, we've heard that statement a million times. But when we understand physics and we understand science, we know... Come on, you're killing my punchlines. Where am I supposed to be pointing it at? We understand that that's not always the case. The fastest way from a point A to a point, or the fastest way from point A to point B is not always a straight line. I show this to all my kids that are going through hard times. When, they, when their parents aren't there, when their parents get divorced, when they can't, their parents can't pay their rent that week or that month, and they don't have food, and I'm bringing them food to a session from this high school I used to work with. It's rock bottom has built way more champions in privilege. And I'll show them this line and say, that's the comfort line. That's your competition. They know where their next meal is. They know where their parents are going to be at. They know that on Christmas, there's going to be presents underneath the tree. There's something different about the yellow line. When it comes to what we learned in understanding concepts, I want us to understand that Remember our education, half of our, class, half of our classes are in the lecture hall, the other classes are in the lab. That's where breakthroughs and discoveries occur. If we're constantly just going off of what's in text, that's where we're going to always be. We've got to be implementing things and testing the boundaries. These are two guys that we've had at VHP. Um, we all worked with them. A uh, guy on the left wanted to do a box jump. He's a triple amputee. That's absolutely ridiculous. The guy on the right, no arms, and he wanted to deadlift. Once again, absolutely ridiculous. There's a famous word, and it got coined by a book, Simon Sinek, and it was, what's your why? And then it became this thing about why and why and why. And I kind of got tired of it. And uh, it's more of start asking, why not? Why can't we do something? Well, why would you add that into that program? Why not? When our training and whatnot's going on, if you can describe what you're doing and with a good reason behind it, I'm cool with it. It's not why, 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 why. It's 
It's why not? We're pushing the boundaries. We're not caretakers. Once you start asking that question, come on. Am I clicking this thing to this dobby? Where am I pointing it? Am I pointing it to the computer? I'll just click that. Yeah. We realize once we start asking why not that limitations only exist in minds with no imagination. We give ourselves boundaries because that's what textbooks do. We feel very comfortable within those lines. Don't become a prisoner to your expertise. I saw this, ex this amazing graph and it kind of stimulated me and it had a line that kind of went up and uh, it had a barrier line with a dash on it and it was the 10,000 hour line. It was the expert line, the line that everyone craves, that everyone wants. And, I mean, even I looked at that, like, how can I spend 10,000 hours doing something to be an expert? Because that's what we want. But it had this line going, and it said, once you got to this barrier, this threshold, that once you become an expert, you become very opinionated, and that's what you are. So basically, the talk was, right before you hit that line, to stop and start learning different things so that we become more creative and not more set in our ways. When people see exercises that I post, they say always, hey man, that's so outside the box. It's not outside the box at all. To me, outside the box is negligent. Knowing that oral health plays such a big factor in wellness, me giving someone a gum cleaning or a root canal, that's outside the box. Me giving someone a single leg RDL, that's not outside the box at all. When it comes to the human body, it's a very complex thing. And we try to dumb it down by giving it traits of like a car or a computer. Like this is the wheels, this is the transmission, this is the, the random access memory, this is the, the hard drive, whatnot. Because it makes it easier for us as coaches to understand what we're looking at. But we're really truly doing a disservice to the human body when we dumb it down so much. A computer, when you click on Internet Explorer, a calculator is not going to pop up. Or, yeah, a calculator is not going to pop up. But for the human body, every input can be many different outputs. Within one squat session, one set of 10, you could have 10 totally different reps. The body is a complex thing. Let's not, let's not dumb it down. When it comes to the body, now that we talked a little bit about what I think is uh, creativity, let's talk about how we see things. I'm not a big Superman fan, but I've seen Ready Player One. It's a great movie. And it said, back on the concept of uh, books, and it said, some people can read War, of Peace, War and Peace and come away thinking it's a simple adventure story and others can read the back of a gum wrapper and come away with secrets of the universe. And I think that's huge because we always want, we're hungry for something else. We're hungry for a new book. And we look at it more of a stack of books. Like if someone posts a picture on Instagram and it's 20 books, it gets 1,000 likes or something because that's cool. Take a picture of one book and read it three times. Read it every year, read it every two years because you'll look at that book different a little bit every time. Everything depends. I went and spoke at a local college and I showed this picture. I asked them, I knew the response I would get, obviously, and I showed this picture and I said, which one of these squats is correct? Everyone piped up and obviously said the third one. And I think this is the problem, especially with social media, is we are in so ingrained to just pipe up in, in cult-like fashion, just bash people because we ride this wave of the best way for us to feel comfortable is to put down others. Understand that there are many variables that go into training sessions. I mean, the girl on the left, that could be the best squat she's ever done. Understand that everyone's victories are a little bit different. Wonder, if you have kids, it is a must watch. If you don't have kids and you want to cry, I mean, it, you can watch it. But uh, he has a quote in it that says, maybe we can't change what we look like, but maybe we can change how we see. 
And I thought that was very profound. It's the onus is on the person of what we perceive reality as. I took this from someone on social media. His name's Joe Lavaca or Joe Leve or some, I'm going to butcher it, I'm sorry. But uh, this is a, a graphic from a World War II plane when they were coming back from battle. And these are where all the hits were at and whatnot. So when leadership looked at all the damage, the first thing they said was, we got to armor up all those spots. We have to armor up that because that's where we're taking the most damage. And the statistician, I think is, uh, once again, I forgot. I'm pretty nervous. But uh, he said, that's not the problem. The problem is the areas that are not damaged because those are where the plane took damage and the plane went down. I think this is a powerful graphic because this is kind of how we look at coaching. We just look for the first thing. The first thing that we see and then we jump all over it. Think a little bit deeper. Correlation is not equal causation. We recently got a Peloton in the Griffith household, and uh, I've not entered that program yet, obviously. But um, my daughter got on it, and she did a little bit of a longer ride than you know, maybe she should have, but I made a bet with her. And um, she was upstairs, and she runs downstairs afterwards, and she just looks at her legs and goes, Dad! I got these huge red leg, spots on my legs. So I instantly panic, and I'm like, oh my God, what happened? And then I stopped and said, were you just on your phone on the toilet? She was like, yeah. <laughs> oh no. That Detective Spooner is the correct question. Uh, the better questions we ask, the better answers we get. And when we truly understand the answers that we receive, it gives us a better opportunity for creativity. Brilliant. I mean, I wouldn't buy them, but I would love them in my stocking. Once again, brilliant. If I had a kid right now, I'd probably invest in something like that. Brilliant. Creativity is all around us. When we're open for it, some pretty special things can come from it. How we approach situations. I think this is a big thing with coaches is we bastardize like technology. It's such a bad thing. Where is it? Or, you know, it's always in the way. Technology is going nowhere. So how do we deal with it? My daughter got a cell phone, which was I was completely against, but you know, that's how rules work in the house. Um, so we have a competition every Sunday at 9 a.m. Who has the least amount of screen time? It'll be a different bet every now and then, but we turn it into a competition because technology is not going nowhere. But if I can convince my daughter to be on her phone a little bit less, maybe that's success. Fortnite, not as big as it used to be. Once again, unless you're my daughter and you're doing it all the time. But, uh, you log on social media and every single coach was complaining about Fortnite. My coach, my kids spend so much time on Fortnite. They're always on it. They're not getting no sleep. I talk, was talking to one coach about a year ago and I said, well, why don't you use it? And he was like, what do you mean use it? And I was like, if your kids are gonna play Fortnite, why don't you use it to be something productive? And we kind of laughed about it and I was like, no, I'm serious. Assign times that your team's gonna log in and they're in pairs of three, and he had the defensive line against the offensive line, the cornerbacks against the wide receivers, and it turned into this fun competition because laser tag is cool. It's team building, it's team morale, we get to communicate on something that we're mutual on, but we don't perceive something like Fortnite as that. It was the same thing. He called me up and goes, I was recording the audible sessions and you just hear the kids, hey, he's in the other room, sweep the room, look over there, look over there. And he was like, I've never heard him communicate like that. Be open to creativity. When it comes to creativity and spontaneity and imagination, we're really not sure where they come from kind of off of bed of our subconscious and the experiences and whatnot that we've had. But they did a study with freestyle rappers and uh, they hooked them up to an fMRI machine and 
they found that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex was the activity and was extremely decreased um, when rappers were freestyling rather than rehearsed rapping. So that's pretty important when it comes to rational situations when uh, someone like myself is right here trying not to say something wrong or in a job interview or going out with your girlfriend's uh, mom and dad. But it's very important when it comes to the concepts of spontaneity and imagination. So where does that stop? Pretty sure it's somewhere between Santa Claus and your driver's license. Uh, they did a study and they found, of course you can, numbers or with studies or whatnot, but you get the point, that 90% of second graders felt they were creative. They felt they were artistic. They felt they were imaginative. They did that same study throughout the years as the decade rolled on with them in 10th grade. It was like 15% perceived themselves as creative. So where are we missing the mark between? When it comes to our kids, we're drilling the creativity out of them. Everything is cause and effect. Everything is right and wrong. Everything's a flow chart with linear trajectories. It's finding ways to show them that there are different ways to get from point A to point B and express their emotions, but having fun with it. Um, if I don't understand what's going on with my wife or my, or my daughter or my son, they'll draw a picture. Hey, color how you feel. It opens conversation. It opens dialogue. This is nothing irregular. If you've ever seen like a creativity study, there's the nine dot study. And uh, if you've never seen this before, I got pretty interested in this and I found a whole bunch of different variables. I gave this to my kids. I sat there trying to do it and I, I was struggling and I finally figured out the first one and I didn't figure out any more. But I gave it to my kids and they figured out the other, they figured out two of them, which I was very proud of. If you had four straight lines, could you connect all nine dots? And that's all I said. So they sat there with a pen and paper and drew them out. And it kind of looked at me and was like, Dad, you can't do this. This is impossible. And I said, no, it's not. You just got to think. And they kind of sat there a little bit longer, couldn't figure it out. And then you saw this light bulb hit. Saw them draw it, draw it, draw it. Well, and I think this is special because I never gave them rules. I never gave them controlled variables. I never gave them lines that they had to adhere to. As adults, we assign imaginary rules and constraints to things that don't have them because they're not normal, they haven't been done. But kids, we have to keep that sort of thought process in them because this is how innovation happens. This is how this room happens. Then they hit me with this one. And it was one of my proudest moments as their dad. I looked at him and said, that's brilliant. And uh, she looked at me and said, dad, you never said I, I couldn't use a thick line. And I was like, you're 100% right. When it comes to our profession of exercising and whatever we want to call ourselves, you'll hear the statements, um, the worst statement is, this is the way we've always done it. And it's funny because the same people that say that statement are the same people that say there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Those are two pretty contradictory statements. So I'll hit you with one from Black Panther. Just because something works does not mean it cannot be improved. This is how we approach training. This is how we approach the body. This is how we approach wellness. Just because we know what currently works does not mean it can't be better. The coach's eye is very opinionated. When you see things, you're going to reference past experiences that you've had. You're going to reference experiences you already had. We see things that we are used to seeing, and we tend to look over other things that maybe we haven't. And that can be, tend to be the biggest thing that's the problem. If you haven't seen this video, it's hilarious. That's what I think most coaching looks like. 
You remind me of a squat that I once knew. But uh, we relate things to experiences and stuff that we've had in the past. If I was to ask you to describe a person or uh, an image or a color, you're going to relate it to something else. And I think, but uh, it's funny because if we go to a doctor, what's one of the things I hear people say all the time? It's, I went in with a cough, someone else went in with a cough, but they got diagnosed with a, a cold and I got the flu and I got the wrong diagnosis. And this is kind of the thing that as coaches I see people run into, because we diagnose with something, if we see something, then we'll diagnose it right away with the next. And we need to look at everything as a different opportunity. There was a story that I heard about two people sitting on top of a skyscraper. One of them was a statistician, another one was a philosopher. There was a T intersection that cars were going to. The statistician knew that 50%, if there was 100 cars that came to that intersection, 50 were going to go to the left, 50 were going to go to the right. And every time a car came, he would flip the coin. There's a 50% chance. The philosopher knows that in every car, there is a driver with, that's making a decision based on the intent that they have. Every decision matters. Everything is different. Treat everything different. When it comes to communicating, we're obsessed with, you look at any movie, how we communicate with aliens. Bottom left, that's based on a true story. Captain Stephen Hiller saved us from an alien invasion, July 4th, 2001. Top left, Arrival, great movie. Establish a common vernacular to communicate with things that look like tripod things. The one on the right, I found on Google, so I'm not sure if it's real. It could be Photoshopped. But uh, communicating with animals, we're obsessed with that. But how do we communicate with each other? When my son was two, we went to the pediatrician, and the pediatrician obviously was telling us everything we were doing wrong. And uh, she goes, as my son, obviously a ginger, and he's jumping all over everything because he's fucking crazy. Um, she goes, how many words does Chandler know? And I said, I'm not sure. And she goes, well, he should know 24. And I'll never forget that because I looked at my wife and I said, holy shit, <laughs> we're way off here. And I said, I think he knows two. And at that point, she said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. H how do I teach someone how to talk, how to, how to do something like that? And she kind of looked at me and was like, I'm not sure either. And it was interesting because that's kind of the biggest thing that when it comes to coaching is, is how we communicate. And maybe not necessarily that our athletes are not listening, but maybe we're not putting that communication in a line of thought that they can perceive it correctly. It's one of my uh, hottest moments as a coach. I was coaching in a room full of football players, maybe eight or ten, and uh, one of my kids that I've worked for a while, great kid, um, we were going up in kettlebells, and I said, yo, Ty, go grab the purple kettlebell. Jump two, ran to grab the purple kettlebell, and he's standing there just looking at the kettlebells. And I'm looking with the kid next to me, and I tap him and go, what the hell is Ty doing? And he's just standing there looking at him, just like zoomed in. And I was like, Ty, what the hell are you doing? He was like, Coach, which one's the purple one? So I stopped, and I was like, the purple one? He was like, stood up, and I, I kind of said it like embarrassing, like, how do you not know? And he said, I'm colorblind. I said, well, I feel like an idiot. But it happened again a week later. Apparently colorblind is a thing in the water of Virginia Beach, as well with Pharrell. But uh, so when it comes to our frequency and how we transmit, maybe it's the fact that I used to work with frequencies a lot in a past lifetime, not when I was abducted by aliens, but uh, or the fact that I've had some awkward conversations with my boy Mike back there about how we resonate at certain frequencies. And I think this is a huge one. It's, uh, you can transmit all you want. If they aren't receiving on your frequency, they'll never hear your message. And I see this, especially with parents, and I catch myself with it sometimes. 
is when someone's not receiving, what's the first thing we do? We elevate our voice. So I compare that to the emergency broadcast system. If I'm on my radio and I'm listening to something and that emergency broadcast radio system comes on, I'm just going to turn it off. It's the same thing our kids do. It's the same thing our athletes do. If they're not receiving and you're not getting it across, you're going to elevate and they're going to shut it down. I read on Google, so it's 100% true once again, that uh, we can hear at 500 words a minute but we can talk at 120. So what do we do with that leftover time? Are we actively listening? Are we actively engaged? One of the biggest things I've learned from the female population that I've worked with, and my wife and my kids, is most of the time, they don't want your input, opinion, or advice at all. They just want you to listen. And I can't describe that better than the hand. Um, my wife will be saying something, my daughter will be saying something, She's turning into my wife, which is going to be scary. And uh, they'll hit me with this. And I'm just like, oh, okay, this is my place. Now I understand. I'll try to pipe up. Oh, oh, oh. And I'm like, oh, okay, I understand. How do we see things? Drake said it best, we live in the same building, but we have different views. I can't describe that enough when it comes to the past experiences that I've kind of dealt with. And I try to reflect that upon some of the kids that I get to work with, is how do you perceive what someone's going through? Uh, this is a delicate arch. I was lucky enough to see this last year. I swear it's a lot bigger than that image does it justice. But this is the difference between standing on one side and standing on the other. Truly majestic, rock column. When it comes to training sessions, I was talking to a coach recently, and we talked about details. And, being oriented and coaching things up and making sure things are moving well. And it was, how much is too much? When do we know when to pull back and whatnot? And I think the best coaches are able to zoom in and zoom out just as fast. They can zoom in and pick, pick out something that needs to be picked out and fix it, but they also can zoom back out and know the bigger picture. When it comes to communicating, there's a coach, he said it, I don't even know how long ago. I think we've, I know him on social media, but I think I met him once, but Keith Scruggs said something and he called it glass house motivating. And it's just this image of motivation and just persona of yelling and what we think works, but it doesn't. And I constantly see coaches that are, it's almost like they're trying to impress their athletes. They're trying to throw up information on them, give them so much especially around coaches here, you hear conversations sometimes and it's just trying to give so much information to prove your value, to prove your worth. And I wanna challenge you, instead of speaking to impress someone, speak to express yourself. Get your point across quick, get your point across concise. Expression goes a lot longer. Um, when it comes to how we talk about ourselves, uh, Walter Payton said, if you're good at something, you'll tell everyone. If you're great, they'll tell you. Little Wayne said, real G's move in silence like lasagna. <laughs> Relationships are, are vessels of transportation fueled by trust. I'm not going to get in too much into building trust and the relationships and bonds that can occur with it, but when there's trust, magical things occur. Um, that's with friendships, relationships, workships. Uh, but uh, this is my boy Bill. He probably changed my life as a coach. <laughs> Collaboration is a huge part of training. Few things build trust faster than involvement. The second an athlete or a business partner, or a friend, thinks that they're involved, they're instantly invested. When it comes to my athletes, it's not, or people that I work with, I say athletes, but anyone I work with, it's I ask their opinion. I want to know what they want to do, what they like to do, what they think works. That ne doesn't necessarily mean they're going to dictate the session, but they should have some sort of ownership in what's going on. Collaborate with them. A lot of the movements that you see that I post on social media, it's not even my idea. 
We're on the floor doing an exercise, and I'm like, hey, I need you to get a little bit more internal rotation here. Is it more stress when you load this way? And they're like, oh, yeah, let me try this. And it's just this collaborative effect because there's no ego on the floor. They're in, and I'm in, and we're together. It's the concept of uh, an optometrist. I heard someone say it one time, and it's, is this good? Is this good? How's this? How's this? And that's how we approach training. It's, I'm trying an exercise, and it's like, how do you feel this? How does this feel? Where do you feel this at? And it's constant questions like that. When you build that trust, I'm always cautious with getting too, I don't want to say too much trust, but uh, it lends to light the concept of hitting the fastball and hitting the changeup. Everyone can hit the fastball, but when things are hostile, when you're presented with a certain situation, how do you adapt and how do you respond to it? One of the girls that I got to work with, um, she just graduated college actually, and uh, we'll backtrack. Um, I used to train this group of older ladies, and they thought it was funny one time, because they called me a diva, that one of them bought me tampons for my birthday. And um, they sat them in the bathroom in the little cubby thing. And uh, I was like, they just put them in there, and we're just like, whatever. And they sat there, and actually, they still might be there. <laughs> but. Uh, one time, one of my kids came in. Kids, she was 18, so let's not get crazy. Uh, you could tell that something was off. I watched her walk down. I picked her up window to window. I could see that she was just kind of bummed. She walked in, shoes untied, whatnot. And uh, we're going through her warm-up, typical stuff, checking the single leg RDL pattern, watching how she moved. And uh, I go, what's, what's going on? And she was like, well, I just got some stuff going on. And I was like, okay, let it ride. Form started to get a little bit worse. She was getting a little agitated. And I was like, yo, what, what is going on? And she said, I got stuff going on. And I looked at her and said, like, stuff, stuff? And she said, yeah, stuff, stuff, stuff. And I said, well, I don't know how stuff works, but I know in the bathroom there's these things in there, and I'm not sure how that works. But if you want to give it a go, you can go for it. She goes into the bathroom, comes out. We pounded. We never talked about it again. <laughs> Creativity. It connects the dots. It bridges the science to the art. We know where we start. We know where we end. Whether you think it or not, all of us are creative. Because at some point, we're making a decision on our process. So how do we become more creative? I think it's pretty simple. You never stop learning. You're constantly educating yourself. Every single person in this room that is, is invested in that first concept. The second one, steal ideas. I always think it's funny when people reach out to me and be like, hey, I'm stealing this, man. I, I, I'm, I can't wait to steal. I'm like, cool, man. Go for it, dude. I hope it helps. If I was worried about you stealing it, I wouldn't share it on a child's platform for free. Like, take it. Exit your echo chamber. If I could challenge you with one thing today, do something outside of the echo chamber that you live in. We surround ourselves with people that agree with our opinions. Uh, we watch news stations that agree with our ideals. We listen to podcasts that resonate with what we feel. Watch something, listen to something that's outside of that. It might change your perspective or it might just piss you off, but it's worth, it's worth the opportunity. See the world, see different things. I thought I knew communication until I was at a gas station in Mexico with no money and our gas light was on. That was an interesting situation. Increase your bandwidth, create more webs. I think the brilliant thing about Summer Strong, and I remember my first year here in 2008, was hearing the diverse group. Everyone's so different. It's hearing a different thought process, people from different cultures, different walks of life. And we get from there, we learn to establish new connections within that creativity. We become less linear in a trajectory sense and more of a flow chart where we can pick different inputs, different outputs, different stimulus from this bed of subconscious that we hold beneath. And the last one, 
lose the ego. I've seen this two times firsthand. I, I obviously haven't seen the start the wars part. Well, except for video games. Now, let's get to the movement. When it comes to movement, um, some of the things that I've posted on social media or that we share, it's, that's not the basics or this or that. And we're not even going to dive too far deep into what the basics are and, and what I think they are and how a squat is pretty basic and functional until the hips and ankle don't do the right thing. And that's a pretty dysfunctional exercise and not basic at all. But when we're really true with ourselves, Foundations don't crack on the bricks. Foundations crack on the mortar. Foundations don't crack on the strength. They don't uh, crack on the power. They crack on movement. Just because the horse comes before the cart does not mean the horsepower comes before its carriage. Make sure that movement is our number one. Then from there, we can load. Cal kind of took a bunch of my thunder earlier, but uh, when it comes to sport, I started realizing that I was kind of missing the dot with a lot of my training. When you watch sport, it becomes powerful. I challenge everyone to get outside of the weight room and go to your kids' events, go to your athletes' events and watch them play. You'll see a lot of movements that you wouldn't think that exists on the playing field, huge angles. What kind of stimulated me to this thought is, I knew this coach that he just had a daughter and he was posting pictures of her, and it was like, team hashtag never dating, and hashtag no boyfriends, and I, I personally hate that stuff. And uh, I called him out on it one time, and I was like, dude, that's a terrible thought process. And he was like, why? I don't want no boys. And I was like, yeah, that's fine that you don't want it, but it's going to happen. And it kind of got me back to sport, because it's, what am I preparing someone for? Because... No matter what, at the end of the day, in six years, this little girl doesn't have to choose me to be in her life anymore. And when that doorbell rings and that boyfriend comes to the door, which will happen, will she be prepared? Because the decisions she makes are going to be when I'm not there. Same thing with our athletes. Are we preparing them from when we're not there? Back to the image of the sport. Make sure we're preparing them for these movements. One of my favorite things to do is blur the warm-up. A lot of the things when it comes to the mobility of the hips, and we're about to dive kind of into it a little bit, is I don't like it when athletes can perceive the, when the warm-up ended and when the workout's starting. It's a blend of strengthening mobility movements, strengthening, you know, adding stability to where they don't have it. And it's this blur of this line. Of course, some people have, if we're doing some sort of glute warm-up or whatnot, they can auto-tune that and just kind of go on their way. But when it comes to the individual movements after that, it's blurring the line of the warm-up to the workout. And this kind of got me on my thought with, and this is what I, I'm pretty sure you know, I'm here for, is the concepts of mobility. So what does mobility mean? I'm not really sure because everyone has a different definition for it. But I'll leave you with a couple statements. Mobility is a lot more than just stretching. It's movement and being strong in these ranges of motion. A lot of athletes don't want to do mobility, but if you trick them and put a bar in their hand, now they're doing strength training. Dialed in. Throw the landmine in their hand. A landmine's brilliant. They're lined up along the racks. If you've got a group of eight or ten people, easy to coach. They're all in one line. They're not free-floating all around in a circle. It makes it real easy to coach. It lowers the center of gravity of the room. Or not center of gravity, that's a terrible statement. Uh, the, the height of the room, I guess. And I can see over clearly. It's probably one of my favorite statements. Mobility is a lot like your imagination. It did get worse because you got older. It got worse because you stopped using it. I worked with a basketball team that, pretty, that challenged me pretty heavily. It was the first time I dealt with tall, slender athletes. I think the tallest kid wasn't even that tall, maybe six, seven. And um, how do I get them in triple flexion? Everything's triple extension and yeah, yeah, yeah. And being able to explode, 
but how can I get someone to be able to absorb? Not just for health reasons, but for movement. So I got into tumbling. I got this from watching a kid's tumbling video on Instagram. And I was like, why can't my guys do this? The second I did this, it was fun. I had kids that I could never get into a squat based off neurological patterns, I got them down into a deep squat with this. We progressed it to picking up a kettlebell. We progressed it to jumping, to trap bar. Now they move exceptionally well. The details matter. Sweat the small things. The feet. I'm always no trying to find things that I see when it comes to athletes coming in. So I'm picking up big toe dysfunction. These two culprits. Um, if you wear slides, obviously. And then if you're a Jordans fan, you obviously know you cannot crease your shoes. So how do we fix that? We externally rotate when we walk. Where I grew up at, we would stuff socks in our shoes so that you can't crease them. I mean, that's how it works, right? But uh, Cal gave the, the analogy of grabbing your toe with a flip-flop. Sure, but that's also how you grab the toe when you can't crease your Air Force Ones. So when I see a kid walk in, I instantly pick up on something like that, and I know we have some sort of problem with the big toe. When we have problems with the big toe and feet, it's creating an awareness with that. So giving them exercise and movements to make them more aware with their feet. Just a couple of things that I like to do and I've done in the past. The first one, wrapping a band around the inside of the foot, I pick that off someone. Um, and then creating some sort of sensory input with the big toe. And then also looking at the, food as, the foot as a tripod, a bridge. I saw an image of a bridge one time, and it was bricks that were stacked up without any sort of mortar or anything, and they were perfectly arched. And that's what held them together. And that's the exact bed of the foot. What's the first thing you notice when you see this picture, besides the fact that this is the correct order of NBA legends of their greatness? <laughs> is the external rotation of the feet. Think about how they're sitting. We are an externally rotated humanoids or something. But uh, we default to that. Look at your feet. Look how you're sitting right now. Everyone's feet are probably open. Everyone's knees are probably open. It's our default. Finding ways to challenge internal rotation. It's one of the biggest things I've seen that we're lacking. Finding ways to strengthen it. This is one of the movements I've done. The shin box position. Some people have great intentions, but no intent. I see this exercise floating around social media, and it looks like a fish in a boat with no water. And they're just flopping all over the ground. There's no intent paired with the movement. Tie intent to our movements. This is great internal and external rotation. Big load. One of my favorite parts about this is the next picture, where it's paused. Look at his breath. He's dialed in. He's into the movement. Mobility, this is not a picture of me. Mobility is great, but if it's not anchored to something, how much is it worth? There should always be some sort of stability and strength associated with the mobility that you have. Because when all you have is mobility, you get this. One of the latest things I put out is this one. And everyone's like, oh man, I'm trying to get my knee higher. I'm trying to get the hip up. I'm trying to get my posture up. Stop cueing the posture. Stop cueing the opposite hip. Everything starts with the foot. There's 26 bones in your foot. So that's 50 roughly, or 26, 27, so roughly 50 in your feet. So that's a fourth of the bones in your body or within three inches of the ground. Cal said it best earlier, strengthen the foot and things tend to fall in line uphill. The best hip mobility is foot awareness. With the football players I used to work with, it's always tight hips. I, it's probably one of my least favorite sayings, in, not in the world, but you know, whatever. But uh, is what does that even mean? The hips have so many things going on. I have tight hips. Well, well what is that? What is, what is tight hips really? Oh, shoot, I'm looking at the wrong thing. No wonder people are looking at me stupid. Uh, but then I got into this concept of uh, when we say tight hips, it infers they need to be stretched. What happens if they're tight because they're weak 
And athletes just don't know how to convey the message properly across. If you've got a kid that sits in a, uh, a seat for eight hours a day, and they're asked to be on the line 20 minutes after school ends, I'm going to side with they probably are weak. When it comes to the hips, I, po I, saw, I posted a, or the video earlier about hip internal rotation. And a lot of the hip internal and external rotations movements that you see are ground-based movements, where the hip, the knee is opening, the knees are moving, there's bands around the knees. Make sure we're stacking the hip with the pelvis over the femur as well. Challenge internal rotation. Internal rotation, disassociation between the hips and upper body. Kind of moving. I got a couple more thoughts. Uh, some extra thoughts. I thought I'd throw them in. Sorry. I've been very fortunate to have good coaches that have reached out to help me and given me guidance when I can't give them anything. I think a big thing with coaches is not a big thing, but uh, it, it's always a perceived outcome. Adam thinks that earlier, something about just talking to talk. When people want to talk to me, I'm in a private setting. I can't give them a shirt. I can't give them an internship. I can't give them a job. So it's always very humbling when coaches take time out of their day to want to talk shop or share their thoughts with me. So I kind of want to share a couple of things that have been pretty critical for me. And... Uh, Hopefully, you can take something from them as well. One of the biggest things, an athlete can athlete without a coach. She's perfectly fine. But without an athlete, I am not a coach. Understand our role in the game. I like to look at it as a Sherpa. A Sherpa's number one job is to get someone to the top of the mountain. Once we get to the top of the mountain, it's me and them, and I'm taking their picture. I'm not in the picture at all. It's my job to get them there, and then it's my job to take their picture. Stop rewarding accomplishments and reward the work ethic and preparation. This was a big thing with my daughter, trying to influence new thoughts and new ideas. Uh, she plays 12U softball, which if you haven't known, they're all going to college. But um, she had a terrible day at the plate. I'm talking... Looking at strike three, you know, grounding out to the pitcher, bad in the infield. So she was pretty bummed. Uh, that night, her best friend stayed the night over our house, and she drug her net to the backyard. And they're taking hits in the backyard into this square net that we have. And I was like, looking at my wife like, holy shit, do you see Carson batting back there? And she was like, I think she's just doing it because her friend's here. But... Moral of the story is, the next day, shit you not, she had the game-winning double RBI to win a game. She's running off the field, high-fiving everyone. She runs up to me with the biggest smile ever and goes, Dad, I did it. And I said, no, 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 no. It's not the hit. And I say, how did I say it? She runs up to me and I goes, do you realize what just happened? And she was like, yeah. I just had the biggest hit of my life. And I said, no, no, no. You spent 30 minutes in the field hitting last night. That's what helped you get the hit on the field today. And she was like, that's what it was. She was like, that's what it was. It was my hard work. And I swear to God, I still get the goosebumps. Me and my wife made a decision about two years ago that we were going to stop spending money on birthdays. That we were going to cut out our Christmas funds, for the most part, besides small things. We don't celebrate Valentine's Day. We don't celebrate any of the other days. We set all that money aside, and we go places. And I was very hesitant the first time my wife brought this idea up. And she looked at me and said, Carson's 12. You have six more years with her. And I said, shit. And I think that's very important. If you had to think about what you got for your birthday last year, would you even remember? I remember every trip I've been on. Spend time, spend your money on places, not on things. I had a coach one time, I was kind of 
Back when I was in college, and it's, you get obsessed with being the best person, the best professional you can be. And I've talked to many coaches, even though I'm in the private setting and I can't relate to college or pro, and I never would say I could, but I think oftentimes we sacrifice the people that have our back for a logo that's on our front. And you can only put your family so, for so long on the back burner before that water simmers out. And uh, I caught myself with this because I kind of forgot who I was. I was uh, acting a little bit different, wasn't listening to the same music, wasn't hanging out with my old friends, and I've gotten back to that. So don't forget who you are behind whatever logo you currently hold. Forgetting who you are will last forever. One of my biggest moments when I was in the military was I went to a retirement ceremony, and one of the guys that I herald is probably one of the best men I've ever met. Um, if you've never been to a military retirement ceremony, it's almost like this, or it's not almost, the, you know, many of, I mean, I was in the Air Force, so, you know, that's whatever it is. But, uh, so there's a lot of video games. But um, he, it was time for the talk about him. And everything was like, he's such a great mentor. He's such a great person. It was endless stories. It was endless, man, do you remember when this happened? Do you remember when you picked me up at 12 a.m.? Do you remember when we were out doing this? Do you remember overseas doing this? And when it was time for him to talk about his family, he had nothing to say. It was very generic. It was very, yeah, we had a, we had a good time in Florida, you know, on the beaches. And it was truly sad. And at that point, I remember going home that night with my wife and saying, hey, I think... I think I need to change. And that was the day I decided to get out of the military. I had a conversation with a good friend of mine, George Carver Hall, maybe two years ago, and we talked about work and family. Because automatically, when someone asks you how life's going, what's the first thing I would say? As I'm like, hey, man, I'm doing great. Just trying to, I'm busy. I'm busy. Everyone's busy. But I'm trying to balance work and life. And we got on the concept of balance. You only balance things that are equal. Work and family are never equal. Need versus want. I got in an argument with my wife a couple years ago. We've had our rough spots. And um, she hit me with, we don't need you. I said, oh, shit. She's like, I'll be fine. I have a job that makes good money. The kids don't need you. They're self-sufficient. I can get them to school. We don't need you. And it's funny because as you grow up, you're always taught the opposite. It's needs versus wants. You only get things that you need, not things that you want. But at some point in your life, that switches. And me as a father, where I'm at in my life now, is that I'm not needed at all. So unless I'm wanted when my kids turn 18, I don't have to be in their life anymore. So be wanted. My wife will say, I don't love you, I like you. Like you is a little bit more powerful sometimes. Family. One of the big things that we do in the Griffith household is have individual relationships with each person. If all of your family relationships are built in the dynamic of everyone together, you're always going to have that same dynamic. My son is a complete hellion. That dude is an animal. And when he's in the room, he's this light that just is like, a, like the, the thing that attracts flies. Everyone just looks at him, and it's, man, Chandler's so crazy, so awesome, this and that. And my daughter sometimes kind of gets overlooked. The second I put her in a situation where my son's not there, she flourishes. Make sure that you have relationships with each person of your family. Go fishing with your son. Go fishing with your daughter. Go see a movie with one of them. Go on dates with your son. Don't give me that macho th stuff. And I'll leave you with one last thing. I was recently talking to what I think is a great coach. His name's Joe Connolly. And uh, we started talking about stressors and periodization. And I'm going to kind of give you a glimpse back into my life. And it's, as coaches, 
We constantly know strength and power and understand periodization, and we constantly need to apply a different stimulus to get a different answer. Where I think with our personal lives, we get very comfortable and we stop applying different stimuluses. And I was doing this with my family. We got very comfortable, we got into routine. Tuesdays we'd eat tacos, Wednesdays we'd eat tacos, Thursdays we'd eat tacos, you know, tacos are good. But uh, we stopped applying different stressors. The second me and my wife started applying new stressors, hey, let's go do something new. Let's go to a dance thing. Let's go to this art thing. My daughter, let's apply a new stressor. Apply new stress because that's where adaptation occurs and we get out of our plateau. I started with Interstellar and I'm going to end with it. Love is the one thing that we're capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space. Maybe we should trust that even if we can't understand it. That's all I got.